Thanks, Marcus. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks to you all for being here. So I will be talking about modal theory of free choice sequences. And so free choice sequences are a concept that comes from intuitionistic mathematics. So uh, this might be familiar to some or maybe most of you, but to just kind of set the scene a little bit. Um, intuitionism is this uh, approach to mathematics. If you ask some people, they'll say it's a philosophy of mathematics. Other people will say it's a, a a mathematical practice, but be that as it may, it's an approach to mathematics, very general, which was uh, introduced by L.E.J. Brower in the first half of the 20th century. And the, the essential idea that Brower started from is this metaphysical view, this thesis that mathematical objects are really all mental objects, they're mental creations. And so as a result, if you want to say that mathematical uh, objects exist, you actually have to think of them. You know, you have to literally construct them in your mind for them to, to truly exist. And as an important corollary of this, we know that all infinities have to be merely potential. Um, that's contrasted with having like an actual infinity. So if you think about sort of the, the natural numbers and the usual kind of set theoretic, uh, usual set theoretic approach, you've got this set which is actually infinite. It consists of infinitely many objects. But for the intuitionist, for those infinitely many objects to exist, you would have to think of them, right? And no individual can actually think of infinitely many objects. So it's really a, a potential infinity in the sense that for any uh, natural numbers that exist or any mathematical objects generally that exist, you can expand that collection. You can construct new ones. So there's no bound on how many numbers you can have, but you never have all of them, so to speak. Uh, but if you want to do math, probably you want to say something about real numbers, you want to say something about the continuum. Uh, analysis is pretty important. So you want to be able to say something about how real numbers as mental constructions can exist. And there's kind of a puzzle here for the intuitionist, since uh, classically we would think of real numbers as being uh, dedicated cuts or classes of Cauchy sequences or something. And these are going to be infinite objects, right? Uh, Cauchy sequence is an infinite sequence. And to make it worse, we need to have equivalence classes of co-convergent Cauchy sequences. Uh, or kind of a, a handy heuristic, even if it's not a good foundational approach, is to think of real numbers as uh, infinite decimal expansions. But then you need the whole decimal expansion to really pick out a single, infinite, a single real number. So how can the intuitionist reconcile this view that mental uh, mathematical objects are mental constructions and infinities are merely potential with uh, the study of real numbers which seems to involve an appeal to actually infinite objects. The solution is this notion of a free choice sequence. So this is uh, the idea of an infinitely preceding sequence or a, a potentially infinite sequence that kind of pins down a particular point in the continuum. Uh, so, to think again about the idea of an infinite decimal expansion, you can think of the uh, sort of idealized mathematician going through point by point and successively picking down the next number in this infinite decimal expansion. And so as the limit of this process, you'll kind of pin down a single point in the continuum. So, uh, we have these potentially infinite sequences that we'll use to kind of play the role of Cauchy sequences or, or decimal expansions or something like that. And so that's how we try to reconcile this idea of mathematical objects as mental constructions with wanting to give uh, an account of the real numbers and develop some analysis in this, this approach to mathematics. Okay, so that's what Brouwer did, but it's fair to say that choice sequences have not been well received outside the intuitionist school. And even amongst people who are otherwise uh, sympathetic to the various degrees with the intuitionist kind of critique of classical mathematics. So for instance, Bishop, uh, he's in the 60s and 70s a uh, major figure in developing constructive analysis. So very sympathetic to the critique of uh, classical reasoning. He says, Brouwer seems to have had a nagging suspicion that unless he personally intervened to prevent it, the continuum would turn out to be discrete. He therefore introduced the method of free choice sequences for constructing the continuum 
as a consequence of which the continuum cannot be discrete because it's not well enough defined. This makes mathematics so bizarre, it becomes unpalatable to mathematicians and foredooms the whole of Brouwer's program. We also have Pfefferman. Uh, you know, his development of explicit mathematics is very sympathetic to this kind of constructivist viewpoint. He says, Brouwer introduced a novel conception, that of free choice sequence, uh, of which one would only have a finite partial information at any stage. Then with the real numbers viewed as convergent free choice sequences of rationals, a function f from r to r can be determined using only a finite amount of such information at any given argument. Brouwer used this line of reasoning to conclude that any function from r to r must be continuous in direct contradiction to the classical existence of discontinuous functions. With this step, Brouwer struck off into increasingly alien territory, and he found few to follow him, even among those sympathetic to the constructive position. One more. Fellow constructivist Tate says, I'm rejecting the Browerian conception that the subject has, it has individuated an infinite choice sequence by the act of beginning to choose its successive members. For this idea depends on a subjectivist stance. The sequence in question is the one that I am choosing. It is always unfinished, but becomes more determinate in time as I make more and more choices. From an objectivist point of view, time does not enter into mathematics. Its truths are time independent. So I think we can uh, sort of distinguish three different objections that are being made in these uh, representative quotations. So the first one is just that free choice sequences introduce a temporal aspect to mathematics. And this is supposed to be problematic because mathematics, it seems, is time independent. It's not like uh, different things are true of the real numbers now than they were in 1820 or whatever. So the truth of math should be time independent contrary to what we get from free choice sequences. It also seems like they introduce a problematic subjective aspect to mathematics. The truths of math should be objective in some way. And they should, certainly shouldn't be subject to, or the, the, uh, the truths of math shouldn't be a, a matter of the kind of subjective, idealistic, creating, uh, creative process that Brouwer is talking about. And then finally, there's this objection that free choice sequences just lead to results that contradict classical mathematics. And uh, we like classical mathematics, so that's bad. Taken all together, uh, there's this general suspicion that free choice sequences are, are maybe, at best, the, the awkward stepchild of Browarian intuition, intuitionism, if not just like fundamentally obscure. I think it's fair to say that uh, for most people, they're just kind of obscure. And, if they know about them at all, they just say, oh, that's kind of that weird stuff that Brauer was doing. Let's ignore that. Against these three objections, I'm going to offer a theory of free choice sequences. And in particular, I'm going to offer a choice of free, a theory of free choice sequences in a classical black background framework using the resources of modal logic. And so I have, I have two main goals here. So the first one is just to show that uh, the idea of a free choice sequence is perfectly comprehensible. We can make good sense of it. And because I'm trying to do this in a, a background classical theory, to the extent that I'm successful in redeveloping the ideas of uh, intuitionistic mathematics that are built on free choice sequences, this would give us a window into viewing uh, intuitionistic analysis and classical analysis as being perfectly uh, uh, compatible. So there's no fundamental contradiction between these two um, approaches or aspects of uh, a real analysis. So the, the basic idea in developing this theory that I want to offer is uh, just taking seriously the idea of free choice sequences as temporal objects, objects that, that grow in time. And so uh, using modal logic or uh, explicitly regarding modal operators as temporal operators, so a temporal gloss on modal logic, uh, we can render this idea of free choice sequences growing in time perfectly precise in a framework, a mathematical framework, that should be pretty comfortable to all of us. Um, if at any point you have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, I'm certainly not going to talk for a full 90 minutes, so. 
So I said I, I want to develop this in a modal framework, a modal theory. So first question, what, what's the modal logic? Uh, well, I'm used, the box is the you know, familiar modal operator. And I want, to, uh, I want to use the modal logic as a way to regiment temporal reasoning. And so we can gloss the box as being, meaning at all future times. And just by fiat, we can understand all future times to be inclusive of the present moment. So we want our accessibility relation to be reflexive. And uh, certainly, at all later times is going to be a, a transitive relation, right? So S4 is going to be our, our modal logic. Um, but here's a wrinkle. The usual box and diamond aren't expressive enough because we want to be able to say that something will hold in the future at some point, some unspecified point. So uh, we can add a new operator, uh, I, math cal i, which uh, I pronounce inevitably, with the intended interpretation, meaning that uh, no matter how the future turns out, at some point it will be the case that phi. Uh, so if you know, we imagine time branching in all these various ways, then uh, you know, box phi would mean at all of these points phi is true. Diamond phi would mean at some point somewhere up there phi is true. Inevitably phi means that there's some set of worlds that intersects every future branch of time in which phi is true. So it may take three seconds if you go down this path of the future, it may take three years if you go down that path, but at some point, no matter how the future turns out, there will be a moment when phi is true. Um, so call this logic S4 plus, just adding the new inevitability operator to S4. Um, unfortunate side note, turns out not to be axiomatizable. Oops. Uh, but then neither is second order logic, and that's still a perfectly sensible framework to work with. And we can, uh, we, obviously we can't give a complete set of axioms, but we give a partial set of axioms, and that will suffice for everything I'm doing today. So uh, all the results that I'll present are uh, followed deductively with a you know, um, finite list of axioms or schema cut. So that's the modal logic. How do we apply that to understand choice sequences? Well, here's uh, four postulates that we can uh, postulate to uh, just understand the very idea of a choice sequence. So uh, we'll work in a three-sorted language. So little x, y, z will range over natural numbers, big x, y, z over sets of natural numbers, and then alpha, beta, gamma, etc. will range over choice sequences. And I want to suggest that this is a way of understanding what it takes for something to be growing in time successively. So first, well, choice sequences should have no gaps. So necessarily for all x, if alpha is defined up to the point y, or excuse me, up to x, then for all z less than x, alpha is also defined on z. And we want to say that they, they keep growing, so you never give up on a choice sequence. So necessarily for all x, it's inevitable that there will be a y such that alpha of x equals y. So every argument is eventually assigned a value. And once you uh, pick values, they don't change. You're never going to go back and erase anything and put a new value in. So for all x and y, should be a box out front. Necessarily for all x and y, uh, if alpha x equals y, then necessarily alpha x equals y. And then the idea that choice sequences are never completed, you only ever get finitely far with them, even though you can then always continue to keep going. Uh, necessarily, there is an x such that for all y, alpha x does not equal y. So there's always some point on which alpha is not yet defined. Yeah? Uh, the <coughs> so they have to be an operator. Mm -hmm. Once something is phi, all futures going from there, phi will stay the case. Not necessarily, right? So, um, obviously, if phi implies necessarily phi, then that will be the case. But phi itself could be uh, a property that ceases to 
Yeah. Uh, and, and in this case, indeed, it will, right? Because once you fix your y, then it'll stay as that y. OK, so this is, any other questions here? OK, so this is just a, I suggest a basic framework. Just, oh, sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, I was thinking, so if, it, so this sounds like not, not, not the same as the intuitionist model, where if you prove that phi is the case, and in all future times, it will continue to be the case. So that does not hold here? Uh, yeah, no, good question. So um, so here's what I do want to say. Once you have a construction, uh, once you've constructed some object, that object never ceases to that object never ceases to exist, mm -hmm. right? And so, from the intuitionistic point of view, when you um, prove that some object has some property, you do that by giving a construction. And uh, so, the way I would try to capture that, the way I would discuss that, is saying that you've given that construction that secures the truth of X has property P, say, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, so for that for that sentence, it would be it would always be true that X has property P, because you've always got that construction. Once you've made the construction, it never ceases to exist. But what is so in that sense, yes, uh, you do capture that uh, element of intuitionism. Mm -hmm. What you don't get is that um, it's not the case that every sentence that is true at a moment will be true at all future moments. So for instance, if uh, I'm in the process of choosing the values of a choice sequence alpha, and so far I've chosen like uh, alpha 1 through alpha 10, for instance, then it's true that for all y, alpha of 11 does not equal y, because up to this point I haven't chosen a value for 11. But I can do that in the next moment. And once I choose a value for alpha of 11, this will no longer be true. So um, in brief, this schema doesn't hold for every sentence. But it should hold for uh, every sentence that the intuitionist would regard as like a mathematical claim, as opposed to just like this temporary uh, contingent feature of our where we are in, in time. Yeah. OK, so uh, this I want to offer just as a way of uh, understanding what choice sequences are in modal temporal terms, the conception of choice sequences in general. Uh, but to develop choice sequences modally or mathematically, we don't want to just know anything about them in general. We want to say something about which choice sequences exist, what kinds of properties they have, and so forth. And so to do that, I want to start with what are called lawless sequences. And then from there, we'll build up to uh, include a theory, uh, consider a theory that includes sequences that aren't lawless. But um, the very idea of a, a lawless sequence is pretty much what it sounds like. It's just the idea that when this kind of idealized mathematician is picking the values of a choice sequence, their choices are entirely free, not subject to any constraints. The sequences uh, that they're defining don't obey any kinds of laws or anything, just totally open sequences. And I want to start with this kind of for two reasons. So first of all, it's uh, a pretty well understood body of uh, choice sequences from the intuitionistic viewpoint. And it kind of forms like a, a, a fundamental building block on which you can, uh, to which you can add other choice sequences. So uh, we'll start with, I'll start by giving you a theory of lawless sequences. Um, then I'll uh, add a comprehension axiom that will show us how to get other sequences on top of that. And then once we have those other sequences, that's when we can start dividing, defining these notions from analysis and so on. So for lawless sequences, here's our vocabulary. Uh, the usual vocabulary of arithmetic plus uh, curly wedge, which 
denotes the, the null object, which is really just a technical hedge, so we don't have to use a free logic. Um, but basically, uh, if a choice sequence is not defined on x, then it's going to be equal to this null object. And uh, we'll, ha we'll have a set of axioms that ensure that the only property the null object has is self-identity. So it's not the successor of anything. It has no successor. It's, uh, you add it uh, to anything, you get an undefined uh, result back and so forth. Um, so, uh, more on that in a minute. Logical vocabulary, pretty much what you would expect. Uh, quantifiers, connectives, set membership, uh, necessity, possibility, and inevitability. And then, uh, I already introduced the logic, it's S4+. Plus. Then we have our three sorts of variables, as I said. So, X, Y, Z range over natural numbers. Capital X, Y, Z range over sets of natural numbers and Greek letters ranging over choice sequences. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a possibly small word. You said that that uh, schema, axiom schema, doesn't hold, right? Five, no. five, and necessarily five. Yeah. Isn't that uh, axiom K? No. K is uh, if necessarily phi implies psi. Oh, okay. Then necessarily phi implies necessarily psi. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I promised axioms governing our null object. It's not equal to any natural number. No natural number is less than or greater than it. It is self identical. It's not less than itself, it's not a successor. Uh, Adding the null object to anything gives you the null object, likewise with multiplying, not in any sets. Uh, alpha of the null object is the null object, and any choice sequence takes the null object if and only if it does not take a natural number as value. So uh, to a first approximation, you can think of this as reasoning in a negative free logic, logic with the caveat that undefined terms are identical, if that's helpful. Uh, and then, of course, we have familiar axioms of second-order arithmetic, so the recursion axioms for addition and multiplication. And then this one new thing that says that set membership is uh, positively and negatively stable, so to speak. So once, if a number is in a set, it's always in a set. And if it's not in a set, then it's never in that set. Uh, then induction and uh, the comprehension axiom. Okay. Then uh, the axioms that are specific to choice sequences, we have these four that I already showed you. Uh, this is just governing choice sequences in general that they grow in time and so forth. All right, now here are the axioms for lawless sequences specifically. Um, a bit of a mouthful, but I think pretty intuitive. <laughs> so uh, S5 just says that lawless sequences can take any value on an argument on which they're not yet defined. And moreover, they can grow one argument, one value at a time. So if I've defined alpha up to five, then I can choose six next without choosing seven or eight or nine. And for six, I can choose any value I like. All right, so for S6, we have that uh, every possible initial segment is realized by some lawless sequence. So necessarily, for any sequence number n, it's inevitable that there will be an alpha with initial segment of length n. Uh, so that was the bit of notation. So alpha over bar of x is the number that codes a finite sequence, which is an initial segment of alpha. So this is kind of like a density axiom. It says that the, uh, the lawless sequences are, are dense and that they, they hit every possible initial segment. Uh, and you motivated intuitively by saying that if there were some sequence number that weren't an initial segment of a lawless sequence, then that could only be because there was some sort of law forbidding it. But these are supposed to be lawless, so nothing should be forbidden. 
7 is, uh, again, a bit of a mouthful, but informally it just says that if the defined portion of a lawless sequence agrees with a, a set or the graph of a relation, then it's not inevitable that it will ever disagree with it. So you can't use sets to draw a line through the space of lawless sequences. And then finally, S8, it's actually a schema in, in the number K, but given K distinct lawless sequences, those lawless sequences can go on to take any independent K values on new arguments. So if I've got alpha 1 through alpha K, and they're so far undefined on the arguments x1 through xk, then they can take any, any arguments, any k arguments on those, sorry, they can take any k values on those arguments, x1 through xk. Yeah. Just so I'm sure I understand the notation, could you just quickly run me through S6 again just to talk, talk mm -hmm. through how, yeah, so, how that expresses the, yeah. Right, right. So um, in the background, we're assuming the coding of sequence numbers. That's uh, you know, totally standard. So for any sequence number, it's inevitable. So eventually, at some point in time, you'll find a lawless sequence alpha, such that the uh, there's an initial segment of alpha coded by n. OK, yeah. yeah. So LH is the length function. So the length of the sequence coded by n, then we're taking the initial segment of that of alpha of that length. Here are my claims. First of all, uh, just generally, modal resources allow us to represent the sequences that grow in time. And I want to suggest kind of on conceptual grounds that the axioms for lawless sequences that I just gave you uh, plausibly capture the concept of lawlessness that uh, the intuitionistic theory is also after. And this claim is further supported by the fact that uh, MCLS proves modal analogs of the axioms of the intuitionistic theory of lawless sequences. Uh, for reasons of time, I'm not going to show you that in detail, but I'm happy to uh, return to that in the question period, or um, I'm happy to circulate the draft that this material is drawing on. So uh, if you want to actually see evidence for that claim, that's somewhere else. Um, but I want to suggest that this shows that we are on the right track. So conceptually, it seems like we're able to capture the concepts that are at play here. And mathematically, we can prove, at least in modal terms, claims that look like the analogs of what the intuitionist is after uh, when they postulate the axioms for their theory of lawless sequences. OK, so I think this suggests we're on the right track. But lawless sequences aren't really interesting. They don't have enough structure to do much with them mathematically. So to actually get any of the interesting mathematics from intuitionistic analysis, we're going to need to add some more sequences that, are, uh, that have more structure to them. So that's what we're going to do next. Uh, I'll pause if anyone has any questions before we do that. start by adding a new predicate L of alpha, just to mean that alpha is lawless. Um, and then we have those first four axioms just governing sequences in general, right? They grow with time, they don't have any gaps, and so on. We'll keep those as is. And then for the axioms that are specific to lawless sequences, we're just going to relativize all their quantifiers to L. So in particular, when we've got this existence claim, there exists an alpha, we're going to say there exists a lawless alpha that has a, that initial segment. Um, and likewise with the other, uh, the other axioms for lawlessness. Then we're going to add uh, also an axiom stating that lawlessness is stable. So it's an intrinsic property of sequences. It's not like a sequence is lawless now but could cease to be lawless later, or vice versa. Is, uh, fails to be lawless now, but becomes lawless later. So it's an intrinsic property of sequences. Now, to get 
this wouldn't say that any sequences exist other than lawless ones, right? It just says something about how the lawless ones behave. So to add new sequences, we get this comprehension scheme. So necessarily for all x, excuse me, if necessarily for all x, it's inevitable that there is a y such that axy, then there is an alpha such that necessarily for all x and y, if alpha x equals y, then axy. So this is, uh, this is important because it allows us to form projections of old sequences. Can, can I interrupt if, if, if yeah. really sort of confusion is, is, is caused? Um, back to the uh, stability of lawlessness, um, the, the first conjunct there, yeah. for instance. Why? why should, maybe I haven't understood what lawlessness is, but it would seem, uh -huh. it would seem that yeah. It, so that, lawless, that, that laws could be, sorry. Yeah, yeah, good. So um, are you thinking something like, uh, look, maybe we make some specifications for the first two or three entries in a sequence, but after that, like, it's totally unconstrained. And so it becomes lawless after those first few entries. Or the other way around. Um, we, had, we, put, we imposed no constraints oh, on the yeah. first, and then, okay, I see. Yeah, and then yeah. we start imposing constraints. Good. Right. So uh, both of those are perfectly sensible things to say uh -huh. if you're thinking of lawlessness as an extensional matter. Uh -huh. If you're thinking of, uh, well, what constraints are imposed as we start uh, defining this sequence. Yeah. Uh, lawlessness, however, is typically understood intentionally. It's a matter of how the sequence is uh, presented or defined or something. So it's, uh, if you think about the sequence, not like just extensionally in terms of the values that it has, but if you think of it as uh, being given by the process of choosing those values, if at any point in that process your sub, um, entering some constraints, then you can think of the whole process as being subject uh -huh. to some constraints. Uh -huh. Even if they're very local and limited, uh -huh. there's still there's still these constraints somewhere in the process. Yeah. Follow. Does that help? Follow? Yeah. I mean, sometimes they talk that way. Like, you might have a sequence which is lawless at the beginning, and then it, it, that means at every stage you choose what value it is. But one thing you can also choose is to make it a, to make it a law at some point, mm -hmm. right, right yeah. now. So those aren't like uh -huh. totally yeah, you can lawless. have that. Yeah. You can have that, right? But those wouldn't count as lawless. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. If, and if you decided sense, that at point after point ten, it's going to be constant. Or it's going to be zero from now on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sometimes they talk that way, like that's possible. Uh -huh. But if it is, then you're not talking about these okay. things. Right. Yeah. Um, also, just from a, a technical point of view, this gives us a nice way to focus on. All right, we know we've got these. Uh, this set of, uh, or this body of choice sequences at hand, now when we add these projections, what do we get on top of that? Mm -hmm. So it's uh, convenient in our space as well. Um, so, I, I mean, in a certain sense, if it's lawless in your sense, then there is good straight yet. You can never impose a law. Yeah, so <laughs> I think Chrysler described this as like a higher order constraint. Right, some, something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You said intrinsically, well, yeah. it's an yeah. intrinsic. It's, it's sort of given that way yeah. that, you, yeah. that no matter how far we get, all we can choose are the values. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. Um, so, so I said that um, this comprehension, this form of comprehension, gives us a way of uh, forming new sequences by projections from old ones. So what I mean by that is uh, if you've got a, a sequence Let me call it uh, gamma, maybe just to just for uh, sake of continuity as notation. So we've got this sequence gamma, and we've already defined it up to some certain point. It's um, might be you know one, three, eighteen, four, whatever. And we want to form a new sequence alpha that it is a, a projection, if you will, by taking twice gamma that's uh, value at each point. So we take alpha and define it to be 2, 6, 36, 8, and so on. So that's what I mean by like forming them by projection. Could be like, uh, give me a, a 1 if this is odd, and a 0 if it's even, or you know, any sort of applying, any way of applying some sort of mapping 
from uh, one set of numbers to the next. Even. So how does, how does the comprehension axiom help us define these sequences by projection? Well, we know that necessarily for all x, it's inevitable that there is a y such that uh, two times gamma of x equals y. So then, applying that scheme, we can infer the existence of an alpha such that necessarily for all x and y, if alpha x equals y, then um, Two times gamma of x equals y. So in other words, alpha of x will be two times gamma of x. Uh, so the restriction the a doesn't have to be stable, does it? Any any formula a is going to work here, right? Yeah, any formula a is going to work here. Right. And it doesn't need to pick it pin it down uniquely either, right? Uh, I could have said two times gamma of x equals y or three times gamma x equals y, and that would give you a choice of picking either two times this value for your choice of alpha here or three times that value for the choice of alpha. So it imposes some constraints, but it need not uniquely define it. So I'm going to settle on the theory MC that it includes uh, the instances of this sequence comprehension axiom where the classical quantificational complexity of A is delta 0, 1, and there's no bound choice variables. So you have free choice variables as parameters, like in this example, but unbound. So basically, uh, you can do any projections by, uh, by recursive um, uh, recursive functions. Okay, so I said that in the end we wanted to capture some portions of intuitionistic analysis, so we need to know something about real numbers. Uh, intuitionistically, real numbers are going to be given us by uh, what are called real number generators, which basically are sequences of objects that converge down to a single point on the continuum. So for instance, this could be Cauchy sequences that you know, converge by the Cauchy criteria into a single point. Brouwer would often use uh, sequences of nested intervals of rationals, nested closed intervals of rationals. Um, it's not as convenient mathematically, but you could also use, like I said, uh, infinite decimal expansions. Just any way of, of picking down a single, picking out a single point. And so I'm going to take Cauchy sequences uh, for my model of real number generators. And so we can basically just define uh, the usual operations, the notion, usual notions of uh, being a Cauchy sequence and so forth in this modal framework just by sprinkling in a couple of boxes and eyes. So alpha will be a real number generator when necessarily for any uh, rational window, you will eventually find an x such that after x, all of alpha's values are within that rational window of each other. So that's just like the, the standard uh, Cauchy criterion of convergence. Yeah. No, I'm just trying to work my, uh, okay. I mean, I, I worked my way through this already, so I just have to do it every time. And this is giving you a Cauchy sequence, but not a with fixed bounds. Right. So there's no constraint on the rate of convergence here. OK. Right. You so just know that eventually you will get convergence. To, I mean, again, I don't have that good of familiarity with the intuitionist literature, but I think they prefer to have Cauchy sequences with fixed bounds. So you must have thought about why well, I know you did. Yeah, so this is just going to be like the most liberal, inclusive notion mm -hmm. of a real number generator. Yeah. Uh, a little later, we'll see the idea of the canonical real number generator, which does have a fixed rate of convergence. Oh, OK. Yeah. So in fact, you've got them both there. Yeah. 
Um, then we get identity to just be uh, uh, necessary co-convergence of real number generators. So necessarily for any uh, window of convergence P, rational number, uh, inevitably, eventually, you will get a, a point in your sequence past which alpha and beta are both within P of each other. Necessarily. Necessarily. Within P. So from that point on. Yeah. The only one that's kind of uh, novel here, not novel to me, but novel to the intuitionist, is this third one, this apartness relation. So the idea of apartness is if you've got two real number generators, uh, in, in the abstract, they might kind of get arbitrarily close to each other, and you may not know whether uh, in the end they converge to the same value or not. But apartness is the idea that uh, two real number generators are apart when you do know that they will always be a certain distance away from each other. So there's a, a definable um, distance that you get that they are apart from each other. So in, in our framework, this just means that uh, there is a P, so we already have one. Uh, there is a P greater than zero, such that eventually, inevitably, we'll find an X where alpha and, after X, alpha and beta are at least P apart from each other. And then less than, pretty much familiar, uh, pretty much as usual, you've got some window P such that uh, alpha and beta are separated by at least P after some point, and moreover, uh, alpha is the smaller of the two. This should be obvious if I were to just think about it, but can you, can you just say, say briefly how a partness goes beyond non-identity? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so think about how identity could fail. Yeah. It would be if it were possible for there to be a P. Mm -hmm. So alpha and beta might converge, or they might not. Uh -huh. And this uh -huh. says they definitely don't. OK. Yeah. Oh, so some futures they converge, and some they don't. That'll keep them from being identical. Yeah. Right. Right, OK. But they won't be apart. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, and then addition, subtraction, and multiplication can but just be defined point-wise. So uh, to take the sum of alpha and beta, you take the sum of uh, alpha 1 and beta 1, and then follow that with the sum of alpha 2 and beta 2, and so on. And this is part of why it's nice to work with Cauchy sequences, because you get these nice definitions of, of the arithmetical operations. Presumably, necessarily point one. That is, so you have these two, two, two sequences, and you want to add them. You can add them at every node in every future. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh. I also have a small point in for the apartments. Why do you want the distance between two uh, generators to be p? Why do you want it to be rational? Why not q? Uh, so we're using we're, we're defining the real numbers in effect here. Uh, so we don't want to assume that we already have them. Um, but you know, moreover, we can put the rationals into the reals. So. Any, if you're separated by a real distance, you'll also be separated by a rational different di distance. So there's no loss of generality. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we just defined all these notions. They better work right. Fortunately, they do. Um, so uh, being a real number generator is a property that's closed under our arithmetical operations. For real number generators that are apart from zero, the multiplicative inverse exists. Uh, identity is transitive and commutative and all, all this. Uh, addition and multiplication are commutative and the arithmetical operations respect identity. Um, there's nothing fancy going on here. It's just kind of taking what you would see as your you know, textbook proof of these kinds of facts in a real analysis text. and. Then, Sprinkling in some diamonds and I. I should know the answer eyes. is. Are you getting a field? You have all the field axioms there. I mean, you don't have distributivity, but I imagine you've got that too. <coughs> the, the multiplication yeah. distributes over addition and multiplication. You've got that under addition, you have a. Uh, yeah. uh, it's a group. Yes. Yes. Check it all the field axioms. Oh, that's pretty. Cool. That's kind of cool. I haven't thought about that. The one that I want to check is commutative or distribu distributivity. 
but uh, uh, given that you're just defining the point wise, it should lift up straightforwardly, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Cool. Huh. Should have told you that a year ago. <laughs> Asked you that a year ago. Okay, so uh, that, that's just the setup for you know the, the existence of the basic objects we're interested in and the fundamental operations you want on them. Now I want to uh, show you how we can get some of the things that are characteristic of intuitionistic analysis in, in this setting. <coughs> so one of the things that's uh, distinctive of intuitionistic analysis is Brouwer's use of so-called weak counterexamples to uh, disprove various classical principles such as the law of excluded middle. Disprove in scare quotes because he's not refuting them, but these counterexamples are supposed to show that you have no hope of proving them intuitionistically. So here's an example of a weak Browarian counterexample. Let Rn be some computable Cauchy sequence converging to pi, and then define a real number generator as follows. Uh, if up to k you haven't found a counterexample to Goldbach, then you just uh, you know, take Rx over x. If you have found a counterexample to Goldbach, then at the first one, you just um, set a constant value for the rest of your sequence. Now, consider the question, is alpha irrational? Well, we know that it will converge to zero if we never get a counterexample to Goldbach, in which case it's irrational, obviously, because zero is rational. But if we get a counterexample to Goldbach, then it will converge to some uh, fraction of pi, like pi over k. So intuitionistically, we can't assert that either of those will be the case, because we haven't already constructed a counterexample to Goldbach. We also haven't proved that there will be no counterexample to Goldbach. So we haven't. We haven't affected a construction showing that alpha is rational, nor have we constructed a refutation of alpha being, irration, being rational. So we cannot assert LEM, Brower would say. We can do something similar uh, modally. So obviously, uh, these boxes are important because the background logic is classical, so every uh, genuine instance of LEM will be a theorem. But think for a second about what the, what the intuitionist is saying when they assert a disjunct. They're saying either determinately we have one of these. We have a construction that gives us this disjunct. Or we have a construction that gives us this disjunct. And so in modal framework, that's something like necessarily we have established that Q holds from now into perpetuity. Or, necessarily, we have refuted the claim that Q holds from now into perpetuity. So this is, uh, this is going back to your question earlier also about the stability of these claims. And so it turns out that that analog of LEM in the modal framework is not a theorem of MC. But not because of weak counterexamples, is it? Well, kind of, yeah. I mean, if, I mean, if the example you're using is gold box, suppose somebody proves it tomorrow, then your example goes away. Well, it's... I mean, obviously you could pick another it's one. It's not literally there. using the same argument, but it's the same style of reasoning. So for Brouwer, the main point about weak counterexamples counter is leveraging some indeterminacy for him in, like, number theory. Yeah, theoretic. no, no, I know, I know that, yeah. right, but... But uh, it's leveraging that indeterminacy to get a logical result out at the end. I'm going to do something similar. I leverage the indeterminacy in lawlessness. Well, that's yeah. And so Brower, the reason, one of the reasons why he introduced lawless sequences or introduced choice sequences generally was to get beyond weak counterexamples mm -hmm. to actually refute excluded middle. And I presume you're going to do that too. So weak counterexamples are like a step on the way that we're going to we're, we're going to draw. Well, I still. Th I mean, I think it's interesting to see how we can capture some of the reasoning that Brower. Brower uh, was engaging in. Oh, but it, the, I'm not saying it's the, the ultimate like no, right, I mean the, capstone of his, his math. No, no, I mean, but. yeah, early on in his career, again, I'm not a scholar here, but as I understand it, early on in his career, he was using weak counterexamples. Not very convincing because each one of them is subject to a 
refutation in the sense somebody might settle it. Mm -hmm. and matter of fact, he, would use, he was using Fermat's last theorem, right? Yeah. Instead of, right, okay, so you know what happened there. All right, so we just go back and do the whole thing again with Kobach. All right, somebody <laughs> settles that one. So, and I mean, that's not a very satisfactory um, attack on excluded metal because it's hostage to always have an example, mm -hmm. you know, which can't be decided, right? Um, so uh, he brought in the choice sequences in order to actually get a refutation of excluded metal. Yeah. I presume that's what you're going to give us, or I hope, right? That is an analog of that in the in the modal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, you don't need a you don't need a choice sequ you don't need a undecided mathematical pi one statement, mm -hmm. right? In order to get in order to get your your result here. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So uh, let's walk through this kind of uh, yeah. this line of reasoning here. Um, see if that answers your question. So we're going to start with this lawless sequence lambda and say it has an initial defined segment of some length n because we know it's going to be finite, right? So just find that n. And let ri be this Cauchy sequence converging to some irrational number. It doesn't really matter what. But then we'll define, uh, we'll define alpha as follows. If the next value of lambda is less than 10, then we're just going to set alpha equal to 1 constantly for the rest of its values. But if the next value of lambda is greater than, than 10, then we'll let alpha follow this Cauchy sequence r. So in the former case, alpha will be equal to 1. In the latter case, it will be equal to uh, some irrational number. And so since both of those are genuine possibilities, it's not the case that necessarily alpha is going to be rational, and it's not the case that necessarily alpha no, is not. No, that, that's the point I'm making. Right? Yeah. That on Brower's page, that is historically right. You don't need to bring up an undecided sentence to get this to work. Yeah. Right. You've you've got one. It's going to work. Right. And it yeah. does. If there isn't anything a mathematician could do and say, "Oh yeah, I settled that one. Now you need another one." Mm -hmm. I mean, this is going to work. Right. Yeah. So the, well, the other thing though is that. Uh, Lambda is always going to continue to be defined. It's yeah. only because we haven't defined lambda on the next argu right. argument yet yeah. that there's this indeterminacy. Once we define that, we'll know whether alpha is rational or not. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's, well, yeah. So uh, by using, here's another example of a, kind of a funny intuitionistic result. By using methods similar to those weak counter examples, Brouwer showed that this natural order on real number of generators is not a linear order. We can do that too. So it's not the case that for all alpha and beta, no, either no. alpha is less than beta. He shows that you can't show that it is a linear order. That's what you're getting a stronger result. Uh, well, he does have, he has this result somewhere too. Well, but what it really nice shows is that we, the, what, it, what the result really is is that really right, really is is that you can't prove that it that it is a linear order, um, and and you're getting something stronger than that. You're actually showing that it's not. I think he actually I think he has in he some have, places an argument to the effect that it's not a linear order, which um, means he can take the assumption that it is a linear order and reduce it to absurdity. Yeah. How can he do that by bringing in a, a contingent matter like you know a mathematical statement that hasn't been proved yet? Uh, he uses Kripke's schema. Oh, I didn't know that he knew Kripke. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, some people have wisely suggested it be called the Brouwer Kripke schema. Uh, I don't know that I need to like run through all the details of this argument, but it's kind of similar to the one we just saw. So you start, uh, this is a case where a picture will be. A picture will be nice. So uh, let alpha just be 0. And then for beta, you have it kind of oscillating around like that. And uh, you leverage some indeterminacy to, from a lawless sequence so that uh, either beta could stop or you know, could merge to a, converge to a constant value above 0 or it could converge to a constant value below zero, or it could keep oscillating and approach zero arbitrarily closely. So 
if uh, obviously if it already stops above zero, then beta is going to be greater than alpha. But if it's ever below zero, it would be less than. But it could also uh, uh, converge to alpha in the limit. The key is that it's not inevitable that it will do any of those. So it's not the case that necessarily we have a p such that inevitably beta will be p above alpha, or p below alpha, or even within p of alpha. The indeterminacy in the lawless sequences percolates up to the relation between alpha and beta here. One more? Two more, I think. So uh, suppose alpha and beta are sets of, excuse me, A and B. Uh, so if we have A and B being sets of real numbers, then Brouwer showed that uh, A and B can't split the continuum. So one of them has to be the empty set, and the other one has to be the full continuum. So in our framework, we need to say something about what it means to define a set of real numbers. Well, real numbers are given by real number generators. And so sets of real numbers should be sets of sets of real number generators. I don't want to deal with the technical complexities of a higher theory of types. So we'll just let, uh, we'll say that a formula defines a set of real number generators if uh, membership is stable and the set respects equality. So if alpha is equal to gamma and alpha is in A, then gamma had better be in A as well. So we'll say that's what it means for A and B to define a set of real numbers. Well, A and then mutatis mutandis for B. Then we can say that if A and B are disjoint and exhaust the continuum, then one of them is the continuum. So and if the other one's the empty set. And the other one would be the empty set. Yeah. So for all alpha that are real number generators, they're in either A alpha or B alpha, and not both A alpha and B alpha. From that assumption, we can infer necessarily for all alpha that are real number generators, either for all, either for all alpha in R, A of alpha, or necessarily for all alpha in R, B of alpha. So uh, one of them is all of R, and then from this assumption, the other one will be empty. A and B are formulas? Yeah, yeah. So the proof is uh, comically easy. Assume that we do have alpha and beta such that A alpha and B beta, and define a new gamma such that possibly gamma is equal to A alpha and possibly gamma is equal to beta. Okay, but then we would have that possibly gamma is in A and possibly gamma is in B. But this is going to be impossible. So, comically easy. All right, I want to wrap up with one more, uh, one more nice intuitionistic result that we can partially capture in the modal framework. So one of the, the most distinctive things of intuitionism, you might, rec might recall is one of the things that, uh, that Bishop and Pfefferman were both complaining about, is that intuitionistically, every function on the real numbers is going to be continuous. And the basic idea in this proof, some details in the background, but the basic idea is that a function from R to R must associate with each real number generator in the argument, a real number generator as value. And since the real number generators are finite at any given stage, you have to be able to extract some information about the value from only a finite amount of information about the argument. So a certain neighborhood containing the argument, some initial segment of it, will suffice to, to pin down a certain neighborhood in the value. So in other words, it must be continuous. Here's a wrinkle, a difficulty in translating this idea to our modal framework. Well, it relies on knowing the rate of convergence of the value real number generator, because otherwise we don't know that we can pin down a certain segment of the value based on a certain segment of the argument. Uh, and the way I've defined real number generators, we may not know anything about the rate of convergence. So we can appeal to this other notion of canonical real number generators. 
which is, in effect, just a, a real number generator that has a tightly constrained form so we know the rate of convergence. In particular, it's always over a power of uh, 2 and over 2 to the x, and yeah. then uh, always within uh, 1 over 2 to the x plus 1 of the pre previous value. Or better. Yeah. yeah. Or better. Um, and so, for our purposes, for my purposes, the important thing is that canonical real number generators have a known rate of convergence. And so now we can get this modal continuity theorem, which uh, can be glossed as saying that if A from alpha to gamma defines a function on real numbers whose values are given as real number, canonical real number generators, then A doesn't have any definable discontinuities. So it's a little weaker than Brouwer's theorem. Uh, I don't know that the full continuity theorem fails. I just haven't been able to prove it yet. So here's a par partial result in towards that goal. So what does it mean for a sequence to be definable? Well, if we have a classical set such that beta, the graph of beta is always within that classical set, then we can say that that set defines the sequence beta. And then if we have a family of definable sequences, we can uh, code the, the sets as a, a single set. And so then if we have uh, beta is in x sub k, that will be a way of abbreviating the claim that uh, x sub k is in a family of sets and beta is definable by x sub k. Then formally, the continuity theorem is uh, Suppose that A alpha gamma defines a function on real numbers where the values of A are given as canonical real number generators. So for all real number generators, there's a canonical real number generator such that A alpha gamma. And once you have the values, they're fixed. So the function never changes the values from given the arguments. And if alpha is equal to beta, then the canonical real number generators that alpha and beta get mapped to themselves have to be equal. So that's functional. That's what this last bottom row is, is ensuring. So assume that is your, uh, that is your hypothesis. Then it follows that there is no family x defining sequences beta i, which witness a discontinuity at alpha. So in other words, there's no definable discontinuity. Um, I guess I can put the proof sketch up if you're interested, but it's not necessarily all that instructive to walk through it, so I can wrap it up here, I guess.